Hey everybody, it's uh, me, Rick, and Danny, not, not Nain. Not Nain. <laughs> not, that, not that guy. Uh, welcome back to our. That I was <laughs> welcome to our colleague conversation. Nain is out on yeah. assignment. <laughs> He's actually at work. <laughs> Somebody's got to pay for this lunch. And today, today we have a very special guest, a good friend of ours, or has actually become a good friend of ours because of the martial arts world. Uh, this is Dennis Duarte. Am I pronouncing that right? You are. You are cool. I I never knew because it's so many different letters now. Like ah, <laughs> uh, we brought him in just because he's a fun guy to talk to. And, oh, thank you. And one of the things that I've learned um, about the martial art world is is that this guy is a um, he seems to be a beacon of. I would uh, say ambassador. An ambassador? Yeah. An ambassador. You know, I mean, Did you I just think... call me a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador yeah. of Communications. <laughs> you know, we first met at one of the gatherings, as a matter of fact, I believe. Is, yeah. that, is that where we met? No, actually, I think we first met. Yes, actually, it was at the gathering. It was at a gathering. With uh, Nick Moreno, who did the introductions. Right. Yeah. And, Brother and Nick. He says, yeah, hey, you guys might want to talk to this guy. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> and then, like we said, he's the ambassador, because once we met him, He's marching us around almost everybody. You know, hey, you guys need to meet this guy, this guy, this guy. <laughs> like, whoa, hold on, okay. <laughs> yeah. well, so, thank you. what interested you in us in that sense? Because again, like I said, you kind of walked us around and introduced us to a lot of people we know in the martial arts world. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I have this knack. I call it a gift. I'm a spiritual man, not a religious man, but a spiritual man. And I call it a gift where I'm able to. Um, Kind of size people up quickly. Uh, a little bit of my background when I was around uh, 16, I found the, the police explorer cadet program. Right. So I was a police explorer cadet in Oakland as well as I did uh, paramedical work on the rigs in, in Oakland and San Francisco, the surrounding areas. And I just kind of learned over time and the people that are around to size up situations and size up people quickly. And um, as martial artists, you know, it's not so much what we see, it's more how we feel. The whole idea of the ha. You know, the yeah. So when I meet people, I have a certain presence when I first meet them, and you know, I use it in business as well. But I'm constantly watching and learning and hearing and just kind of getting a sense. And there's uh, certain people you, know, you click with sooner than others. And that's nothing negative, it's just, you know, the energies that surround right. you. So when I met, uh, you know, Danny and you both, um, just kind of talking to you, hearing you and Nick Moreno talk, and then eventually Grandmaster Green and you all talk. I'm just like, okay, these are people who think in the same mindset that I do, and we, I mean, the Royal I, uh, the one Filipino martial arts folks. And so, as I just kind of got to talk to you and Danny more and more, I realized that we just think a lot alike. So, what I, I do what I do, uh, when I meet people and I like them, I introduce them to the other people I like, and that's who I am. <laughs> well, we appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, we, we were fairly unknowns in, yeah. in, in the circle, so that was a really nice little... <laughs> I, I, I smile because one of the best blues band I've seen was on... Be I'm digressing here. I went to Memphis and May Barbecue Cook-Off. If you ever have a chance, Memphis and <laughs> yeah. May Barbecue Cook-Off. There was B.B. Uh, King's place, and he had a group called the Famous Unknowns. And, I, and I, I chuckle because my goal is to be a famous unknown. Right. Yeah. That's funny. Now, you mentioned 101 Martial Arts. What is that? Got it. 101 Filipino Martial Arts is Grandmaster Harry Green's uh, combative stick and knife uh, fighting system. Uh, Grandmaster Green, which some of you may know and a lot of you don't, is a former uh, Special Forces Green Beret. He spent a, two, a couple tours in Nam, um, one tour in the jungle, which he, uh, I'll leave it for his segment so he can tell you where it came from, but he learned it in jungle school prior to going into in-country in Vietnam. He's taken that over the course of the years in the military, built it out, uh, it is a fighting system, and he teaches that to us. Fighting system as in combative rather than a martial arts or a kind of artsy or no? Well, you know, it depends on how you want to look at it. I look at it as a fighting system. He right. calls it a fighting, it, it's 101 Filipino martial arts. And we have this, him and I have this playful discussion all the time. It's like, you're a system, because I'm an art. You're a system, I'm an art. See, and, <laughs> and, and the reason why I said it is because yeah. me and Danny had started talking about that. It's like, is, are we really an art or are we a system? Or In my mind, you're a system. Yeah. Yeah. In my mind, you're a system. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you why, because that's what I was leading into. Is that when, and there's nothing wrong with either. I want to be clear. There's nothing wrong with either. Don't, don't, don't <laughs> at me or anything like that. And we may contradict you. <laughs> that's fine. Because we have our own <laughs> interpretation of what we're so, trying to do. My, I, that, that's, you know, that, that's why I love these conversations, because yeah, yeah, this yeah. thought and deliberation, that is the core essence of everything I believe in and who I am, because with thought and deliberation, you move forward quickly and smoothly. Um, fighting system. 
versus finding Earth. Uh, a system, I believe, comes with, in my personal opinion, um, the mindset. It's all in the mind. Uh, uh, Teresa was on last time. Right. And I loved her answer where she talked about, you know, it's about the mind. Because ultimately, everything we do in life, everything we do in life is about the mind. So when you look at it from a martial arts perspective, what is your intent, right? The, the why is, to, to quote Simon Sinek, why. So when I looked at what Grandmaster Green was doing versus other martial arts that I partake in, his was a system. I'm coming in, I'm going to do something, and I'm getting the hell out. Other systems will, will other martial arts will, will, that'll be a component of what they do, but it's encompassed in the art, where his is more just, here's the system, and then we can do stuff around it to make it an art. So a, a minor difference, but that's how I look at it. So Danny, explain your, your, your version of what art is, because well, this is what... <laughs> as far as the culture is concerned, in FMA, there is right. the whole culture, uh, from the time that it became more commercialized rather than being taught to families. Right. Now it's out there, it's to the public. Now they're teaching this in a sense that they want to show you everything that they have in this umbrella called the art. That's the first thing. Okay. What do they want to show you? Huh? What do they want to show you? Just what they okay. want to show you. Okay. Right? <laughs> but more importantly, it's how they're, <laughs> how they're trying to show you. It, it, and it's because of the Western world, yeah. you have to show it in a systematic way for them to learn. Yeah. That's the Western way of learning. For us, it's just, or in the olden times, you're just given stuff. Mm -hmm. No specific order, you're just given stuff that, okay, th this is it. The first time I heard about FMA, or when the teaching started to, to come out, <coughs> when, the, when the tribes of the Philippines they have to protect their village. Even at the youngest, I said, this is what you need now to help protect our village. This is what they could do, right? This is what you could do. Right. And that's the way that it's always been right. taught. There was no system, as in the Western world, here in the States, they have to go by the numbers. That's the way that it's picked up, right? So in a sense, they, to me, I, I believe it's subdued in a way because again, in the Western world, you have to protect yourself from legal matters. Right. So then you're not even taught the real stuff <laughs> unless you go behind doors. I get that, that. that. That's, to me, that, that's what I understand it to be. And, and it's because, because the system is now subdued, then you're not really being shown. Now it, it's given the title of, oh, this is the art. And it's to me, it's. <laughs> I'm trying to be trying somewhat to be, trying to be diplomatic. Well, well, he took his to glasses off, so we're getting a little yeah, nervous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then again, that's just my opinion, right? And how the system is perceived, or how the art is. Um, the art then becomes that the fact that it's being shown the same way every time. There's no evolution within the art. From the, let's say that in the 40s and 50s, when the masters first came here, in the farmlands of Stockton, mm -hmm. you know, and, and of course they're throughout the the nation here in the United States. But let's say here in California, Stockton is a farmland area. That's when the uh, when the uh, Filipino masters that came here, that was their job. Mm -hmm. So they became farmers. Now it started that they they it was introduced to just family. Even here, it was just for the family until somebody said, hey, we should teach this outside of the family. And then it became that. Um, I, I think Angel Cabalas is probably one of the first yeah, ones that, that, that did that, yeah. right? So, and then from so that point, then they, they created this uh, system. But again, to me, I still don't consider that. It's, you have to sort of like um, market. Then you market this as an art. Oh, this is a Filipino way of doing things. But that even they has changed because of who you're trying to introduce this to. They may not understand. They, you, you just give me stuff. What am I supposed to do with that? They don't know that way of thinking. Well, right? I, 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 I get where you're going with that, and I will, I will tend yeah. to agree with it in theory. Um, I think. Well, I'll agree with it, mm -hmm. but 
there's, I think, reasoning behind it. You, right. you adapt to your environment. The environment doesn't adapt to you. So you spoke of how they came from the uh, Philippines, and then they landed here in America. And the Western mind has a very distinct way of learning. Yes. And it's very counter to other cultures, primarily Asian cultures and so forth, because it's, it's based upon the risk-reward uh, mindset. If I take this, what's my reward? And if I don't take this, what is my risk for not taking it? And if I if I learn this subject and I don't learn it enough, what's the reward or what's the risk of not passing the test versus learning enough to pass the test? So I think they just adapt. Again, I'm just speculating yeah. here, pure, pure speculation, <laughs> that they adapted to their new environment. Where I, I will say that I think where it, it actually favors anybody in the Mars stars, particularly in the Western world, is that it gives you structure to work with it. You spoke about yeah. in the days of old where they would you know, teach the kid, the six-year-old, if you will, what he needed to know because that's all he could do, right? How's that different than a white belt? Yeah. Or a new student? Yeah. It's the matter of, so I, I think we're going to break it apart into two different areas. One, the structure in which you teach, I agree with. There should be a structured approach. Uh, when I share, I don't teach, I share. When I share with people, even though I'm sharing with them and the expectation is modified, we can talk about that later if you want to, but um, I have to start with our outside number one with the number two counter because that's how Grandmaster Green started with everybody and, and that's just the progression, the first step in the progression that they need. So that's, that's correlated to what you're talking about, but in my mind a mutually exclusive uh, differential is, okay, what's the intent behind the teaching? And I think that's maybe where we're probably getting right, to. So let me give you an example of what, right. how we see things, okay. or at least if, if I'm going to teach you something, and let's say we're just friends, and, and my family says, oh, you're not supposed to teach anybody, you go, but dad, I want to teach this guy, he's a really nice guy. And he says, okay, the first thing I would teach you, I'd say, do this, uh, okay? uh, one up, one down, do this, just back and forth. It's like, cool. Right, all right, so there, I'm, and in that, I just taught you a bunch of things. I taught you how to hold your knife, Mm -hmm. I taught you how to thrust, and I taught you how to slash. Mm -hmm. Just been doing that. Mm -hmm. And the question's got to be, well, what? <laughs> right? how, 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 how did this happen? Right. You know, almost like in uh, the Karate Kid movies. Yeah, yeah. Right? You, you show emotions. Yeah. But it's not in a structure where, where we say the yellow belts have to learn these set of things first. I could have jumped in at any point of, of our system and taught you that first or something else first. Mm -hmm. I give you a basic idea. Right, which is maybe the, like the first month. Once you got that down under your belt, once you understand what that all means, then I can bounce around and teach women. And there is no real set way. And that's why Dan is saying it's not so much when, when they did it in the old days, you know, that day's, oh, what do you want to learn today? And that's what they learned. It, it isn't anything that was set up that every day today you're going to learn there's Tuesday, you're going to learn there's Wednesday. It, it's nothing like that. But what does that matter to well, now, because again, when you first go into a school here in the Western world, there's a structure that says you have to learn this one thing first, followed by this, followed by this, followed by this. Yeah. I, I, and I think there's, now, you and I have had deeper discussions prior to this, you as well, mm -hmm. where I, I'm not a fan of that because of the fact that I think it, it takes away from the, the individualistic learning process of the person you're, you're teaching. But I think from a business standpoint, you absolutely need that in order to keep your doors open. Right. So, yeah. so from that perspective, I think there's a validity for it. Plus it makes it oh, easier yes. when you're dealing with a group of people right. versus individuals. Um, ultimately, and I got a quote, uh, Grandmaster Ron Saturno. I heard this about four, maybe five years ago at Grandmaster Michael Smith's uh, IWA event in Reno. And it just, for whatever reason, some things are just said that are benign to most people, but other things just hit you like a, a splash of cold water in the face. And he got up there, and I'm paraphrasing, so if I get this wrong, don't blame him, and don't at me in anything that I am a part of. Um, he says something to the effect of, he goes, I hear all this bullshit about, you know, my, my, school, my system's better than his, or my master's better than his. He goes, I don't care about that. Right. He goes, the only thing I care about is the student who found the right master. And that almost knocked me over when I heard it. And that's five years ago. And that's how I focus both my training and what I share with people. It's like, am I from the trainee, the student, Am I able to, um, let's take Grandmaster Green for instance, am I able to, to give him all that 
that student essence that I can in the moment that we're together. And if I'm sharing with him or somebody, am I able to give them as much essence as I can as an instructor? And that's a fine line to walk sometimes. And it could be a tiring line because all these other factors come into play. But ultimately, the, the grander umbrella that falls under how I look at things, and I think you folks do the same, is student first. Yes, yeah. definitely. The most important person in the room, regardless of, of where you are, is that student. Right. Because we know this shit already. Yeah. Or at least more than they do, I should say. I wasn't saying anything wrong. But we know more than they do. And it's our job and coming to share with them till they get to the point of hopefully knowing as much as we know and to the preferred point of knowing more stuff than we know. And but that see, and then, and then along that lines, though, you get those students who are a little different or don't comprehend the same way as everybody else in the group. And that's why, you know, our, our, our idea is that we don't want to teach a big group because we feel it takes What's away a big from group? More than 10? <laughs> yeah. That's fair. You know. Yeah, any given time. And again, uh, the space that you have for mm -hmm. 10 people, um, if you were to have, especially because of the sticks, yeah. you need at least six feet between Right. So students. we're very COVID friendly. That's right. so <laughs> yeah. You took my tag on That's my brother. Yeah. Right? So you, you, for one, you just don't have the yeah. space for right. that unless you're in a big gymnasium right. and, and uh, you, you can actually spread yourself out in, in that sense. But five people or five sets of people mm -hmm. working out, you, you need a lot of room for that. Yeah. So, and, and that's the first thing. Then the, then the next stuff is, is again, um, if there's too many people in the room, they tend to, if they're not really paying attention to the instructor, you may be talking side by side. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's all the distractions yep. as well that, that can happen with a larger group. So in that sense, that's why I prefer, if anything else, three people in the room. <laughs> one person watching, two people Good doing, training. one is a teacher, one is the student. Right. Rotate. <laughs> Right. Ultimately, optimally, optimally, that's a good yeah, way to you, go. that's yeah. the way. So, if anything else, six. Yep. Then you have two sets of people, three, uh, uh, two sets of three, that's going on in the room. That that would be ideal. I agree with that. I mean, right? you know, when I used to share at uh, Professor Bob Gomez's place, right. he's got a small place. Yeah, uh, it's a <laughs> nice one. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. nice. It's cozy. <laughs> we had uh, at the most we had, I think, about. Six Six or seven people on the floor, and, and you know, it, it's it, it's in his garage. Yeah, it's a, he, he literally transformed his garage into an actual dojo, mirrors and all. <laughs> but um, but I get the space thing. But one of the things I, I I grew to like about that was I can stand here and look in a space the size of this area here while people are <laughs> I'm not going to while people are working, and I can kind of see everything. Right. In the sense where if somebody's doing, and we do this enough where it's almost intuitive, you see somebody doing something, it's like, do that again? It's like, yeah, yeah we need to go work on that. Yeah. yeah. So I like that. Um, you know, when you're, I've been a part of um, large groups, like at, you know, workshops and seminars, and that's fun, but you need to have, in my personal opinion, if you're in front, you need to have two or three proctors in, in the audience just walking around mm -hmm. making sure people are doing stuff properly. Because, you know, the guy in front sees it, but the gal who's three rows back may have, may have missed that nuance. Yeah, had no clue what was yeah. going on yeah. over somebody's shoulder. Yeah. You know, and I talked about that in the past where we, we say, you know, in the old days when I was doing Kempo, mm -hmm. you know, they just said, follow the guy in front of you. But if I couldn't see I'm not a fan things, of that. Yeah, I mean, and you remember those days. Yeah. And, I, and, and I hated that because I, I couldn't get a lot of stuff because the guy in front of me was doing it wrong, which meant that I'm going to do it wrong. You know, I, I get very frustrated, and it's been something that I've been working on. I'll be 56 in September, so now I'm about 40 years or plus. So I get frustrated with wasted energy and motion and, and time. Right. So I, I, I want to learn something, and I want to learn it right the first time. I think everybody's like that. Just to, <laughs> I'm just not that special. But the frustration aspect of it really just uh, takes away from the experience. So when I went through some other instructors, my Roger Kempo instructor, Ron, his Grandmaster Ron Steller, he holds group classes, but I like the way he does it. He does the group stuff for the, the, the movement, and he breaks it down by belt rank, and then works with each section so they can kind of grab what they can. So I think that's, if I were ever to teach a, a large group, that would be the model I would follow. And Grandmaster Green is pretty much one-on-one -on -one stuff, which I absolutely love, because yeah. as you guys know, you, you pick up on the well, your hands should your hands here, or they really should be here. It's like it, you can't, you can't. That's probably the best learning method. Right. So. 
That, that's really cool. Um, so let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. You've done several different systems, right? I've, I mean, I've, I've played with some. Yeah. You've played with different ones. Yes. Which was your favorite? <laughs> uh, the one that works. The uh, one that works. works. Well, here's the thing. So uh, just for the audience who doesn't know me, so I, I found, uh, unbeknownst to me, it was Kaiju Kempo, but I found Kaiju Kempo at about 15. And I had some issues in school. I wanted to take, I want my dad to get me a knife. My dad says, nope, I'm not getting you a knife. My aunt says, well, hey, you ever thought about doing karate? And I said, keep in mind, this is uh, 15, let's see, I was in junior high school, so about <laughs> mid-70s, I said, yeah, oh, you, later. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I said, you mean that Bruce Lee shit? And she yeah, goes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, forgive me for those uh, just uh, conversations like that, so my apologies. Um, so I said, um, I said, well, I'll give it a try. And I went, because there's a gentleman teaching out of his garage, and I spent uh, two, the first Saturday, I walked out of an hour with him, and it was just fantastic. Five bucks a session, remember those days? Oh, yes. So, well, mine uh, were free, so I had. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I started there, and then I went on this kind of search, and I, not, not purposefully, but it bit me. And I did, and I'm, I'm kind of an intellectual guy. I go to the library, I read up on stuff like that. So I tried six months of Aikido, six months of Taekwondo. I am not a kicker, just so you all know. <laughs> six months of Taekwondo, six months of Judo, six months of this, six months of that. And then I found um, a hybrid martial art uh, from U.S. Karate, Grandmaster Joseph Oliveira. Then from there, I moved into uh, Kaiju Kempo, now Grandmaster Joseph Bautista Sr. And then uh, took a long hiatus when I got married, found Grandmaster Ron Stiller to learn another leg of the Kaiju Kempo system, the Game Boy system, which I black And uh, then I found Grandmaster Green. And I'm going to tell you what I like. The, out of those systems, I like them all, and I'm not being diplomatic. I like them all because each of them taught me uh, what I'm good at and what I'm very bad at. So, and being able to do that and, and continually analyzing over the years, uh, factoring the good parts of Kaiju Kempo and the very good parts of the Filipino stick fighting because my footwork has become phenomenal in Kaiju Kempo because of the FMA. Right. Um, I'd say if I had to pick one to answer your question, it would have to be the FMA component for the footwork and the close-in stuff. Because in the compass and all that, I realize I am a close-in fighter. I like being in close because I'm fat. And being fat, I can <laughs> I can steal people's space and structure right. very easily, so that that's the thing. You know, that's funny that you say that because um, when, when Danny and I talk about stuff, you know, one of the things that, that Danny insists upon whenever we have a student come in who may have already had a background in anywhere else, it doesn't matter whether it's Kaiju, whether it's FMA or whatever. Right? And I used to say, oh, just disregard all that, forget that, empty your cup, blah, blah, blah. And Danny said, no, that's wrong. Yeah. I said, well, what do you mean, Danny? <laughs> okay. So, We've had this the influences that whatever art that you have, you've already been influenced for one. You already have a mindset for one. What I ask now is just throw that in the back of your head. Yep. Right? At some point, we're going to peek in there and we're going to ask you to bring out some of those things so that it can be relatable to you. Yep. All right? We'll take whatever we're going to give you and say, hey, reach back in the back of your head. How does that compare or how does that help you understand you better? Because we're not going to be able to change you. Those are influences that you had from day one when you were born to this point. You are this individual. And that's why we cater to the individual. <laughs> and, and because we truly believe that. It's hard to change somebody in their ways. And, and no matter how hard they try, and, and they'll pick up what we're going to show them, but ultimately... But they still fall back. <laughs> yeah. They, they will always fall back to, yeah. to what they have. Or what they have. That, or what they have. Yeah, because it right? sticks so hard. So it, it's so ingrained into them. At some point, they will separate that stuff in the back and say, or bits and pieces of it. Bits and pieces, and yeah, say rather than the that whole part thing. doesn't work well with this. But I like this, and this is the part I'm going to keep now. This is now my new influence in who I'm going to be. 
Is that what it's supposed to do? <laughs> That's what it's supposed well, we, to do. Well, it's called no, evolution, but... Right. Well, 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 I mean, but, but there's a... There's a, there's a big but, <laughs> but... But isn't that what we're supposed to do by the lesson of everybody that revere... Everybody in the martial arts reveal is Bruce Lee? Yes. Keep mm-hmm. what works and, and throw away what mm-hmm. doesn't? But it isn't so, what always goes on, though. That's true, true. Right. But two, two points to make. First off, keep what works and throw away what doesn't. Okay, what works? Right. What works for you is going to be different than what works for you. Exactly. Works for me. So this is where I think, you know, to your earlier question, this is kind of what, through conversations. I think this is what I picked up on where I think we, we, we hear some potico is um, when I, this is why I don't teach. I share. There is a difference, a fundamental difference. Let me explain that if I may. <laughs> yes. All right. So when, when one teaches, there's an expectation for the student to learn. Meaning that the student now, and think back at any class you are, karate, college, what have you, where you go into a class, you're expected to learn whatever the teacher puts in front of you with the intention of being tested on it later, right? Okay. There's, I believe there's undue stress added to that. That's personal opinion. So what I realized is that when you share, and I, I, I can't publicly share what I do on camera, but I, I work in the financial services industry. I help people with their, with their money. And I don't tell them what to do, I share with them things that they need to contemplate so they can get to where they want to be. Now, where did all this kind of come from? Um, I'm a certified coach, trainer, and speaker for the John Maxwell team. John Maxwell in the leadership world is one of the largest uh, providers of certification for uh, coach trainers, coaches, trainers, and speakers. And John Maxwell says leadership is nothing but influence. And that's when you are in front of a class, you're in front of a student, you're, sh- you're leading, right? So your influence. So in order to influence somebody, you don't tell them what to do. You share with them what your thoughts on what is happening in front of them. And then when I have coach, I have some coaching clients. So when I coach my clients, I don't tell them what to do. That's mentoring. Coaching is, okay, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? You trying to get to? And how do I help you get there? That's coaching. And so. That encompassed in that coaching model that I that I use is at the core of it, at the basis of it, and at the heart of it is sharing. I don't. I just share with you things that I know. So um, I always tell folks it's kind of funny. I, I kind of came to this conclusion a little while ago, is that I'm an aggregator. I, you know, so you know, friends of mine call me Denny Google. You know, <laughs> I just take in a bunch of stuff from everywhere, and then I share it freely. And that's where we. That's how we kind of got. To so it. it's funny that you say it that way because a lot of times when we're showing something to somebody, sorry, it isn't the idea that, like you were saying, you know, you you take something and you say, "Where are you at at the moment?" Mm-hmm. And I always tell the students that you know, when you're when you're in a fight, you know, forget the technique stuff and the drilling and stuff because that doesn't work in that sense. Because you have to be at that moment in that fight. Whatever is happening is what you need to do, and having to run through all these techniques and things oh well this one work no well, that let me let me try you don't have time to do that you, you you can't say okay hold on let me try this first and then try it again you're not you know uh, dr stranger he does 600 variations and see which one works yeah. <laughs> so you have to do with what's in front of you at the moment what works for that time that you're seeing right now you can't start drawing back and just you know we always talked about the analogy of uh, naeem going into his file cabinet yeah. trying to pull out the card that Oh, this works for what I'm doing, but by that time, it would have already been dead, <laughs> right? True, true. So the idea is, when you're working these techniques or when when you're working these ideas, when a right punch comes, where was I at the moment? Did I have my right leg out, left leg out? Okay, at this moment, this is what's happening. Here's what I got to do. What do I have? Oh, I know what this. Ba ba ba. And there is no time to start thinking about, you know, like you said, because you have to be in the moment in any particular fight. And like you said, because it's the individual. They have to do what they know that's best for that moment. Does that, does that make sense? It does. It does. Um, I'm sorry. Finish your thought. No, and, and that's right. Because when, you when you're bringing up your, your story about what you do at your work, it's be, very similar to what we try to show the students that you can't fight or you can't do this three-piece technique like a sombrata or whatever and expect it to work in that moment. You know, when something's kind of like, oh, you got to do inside one or outside 11 or whatever. You can't. I don't. I don't see that the time of the logic in doing something like that. If that's what you're training to be able to do. Okay. So let me ask you this: What's two plus two? Four. What's two times two? 
Eight. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> we'll go slow. What's, okay. what's two plus two? Right. Four. Four. All right. So, so I agree with what you're saying in theory, but I'm gonna I'm gonna part company with you because I believe that there is a significant need for rote training. That's what we're talking about. Right. Okay. So I just asked you what two plus two is. You said four without hesitation. How do you know that? That's what I was taught. How were you taught it? Uh, in math class, and showing four apples, and they put two side yeah. by side. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's how you started, right? And then as you got from class to class to class, that apples became numbers, and numbers became, okay, two plus two, then you have one, two plus one, two. Yeah. So it's all the road training, right? right? But when you need it, two plus two, oh, that's four, okay? So I think in the martial arts, you have to, particularly if you got a brand new student, you have to teach them something rough. I mean, we, yeah, it, we all know this, and, right? And, and, and you know, and, and let me not be misleading in that yeah. sense because like we, when we when we had mentioned earlier, when we train somebody, you know, yeah. the first few months is the road training right. that you're talking about. Right. And once you get to a certain level, say, okay, now, kind of put that aside. That won't work in this particular scenario, why? Now you're talking about arithmetic, guys. That's what I was thinking. All right. So that's the next level. Yeah. Exactly. So you know when, when you're when you're learning. That's where we are in the beginning. That's why exactly. it's a little different. Yeah. Well, it goes. It goes back. <laughs> I love these conversations. It goes back to the trust thing because a student is still when you got a new student or somebody who doesn't know your, your system, and they come in, you're feeling you're filling each other out. And the student has to understand, okay, what, what am I doing here? And you have to figure out, okay, what's the student doing here, right? Well, that's where that two plus two equals four comes into play because they have to have something they can just believe in. Because when you right. when your teacher said, there's, you know, Rick, there's two apples here and there's two apples here, how many apples do you have? I said, I got four, right? Well, you have to trust that the teacher is telling you the truth and that's correct, right? <laughs> so, but as you progress past the rote understanding and then trust, and see, there's a double, there's a duality occurring here. You're learning something structurally, but also you're building trust. When you get to the point where it's like, okay, I trust that this is both what's being shown to me, plus also mathematically this pencils out, then we start getting into arithmetic, and that's what you're talking about taking to the next level. Well, yeah, and, and that's why, like, for me, for, for the way Danny sees it, the way he talks about it, we've always, anytime we're teaching someone, we always say, we look at the scientific part of it. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not doing the, the simple, oh, just follow with the guy in front of you. We say, here's why this works, because physics demands this works, or body mechanics insists that this works, and there's the trucks. Yep. When, when, you're, when it's told to you that, oh, this is scientific, okay, you can't cheat science. Nope. So but it you has still to have to prove it to them. Right. Right. And, so and we do that. Through the sure. exercises. Yeah, well, that, I wasn't telling you. Oh, no, no, no. I, yeah, I yeah. love this. Is, this is good. So <laughs> when you have to prove it to them, then they get to feel and understand at the same time. Especially with mechanics. So you guys don't need to hear. That's where I was taking you. <laughs> <laughs> Just let's have a conversation. I'm going to get some coffee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, again, it's when it's proven, mm -hmm. the trust is automatically mm -hmm. taken from that because I trust you now because mm -hmm. you can prove to me that this is the way it works. Oh, yeah. Now, as far as structure of, of things that we teach. If I told you there's only ten things that will ever happen in the fight, you would say, "Show me those ten things." Mm -hmm. That is all that I will ever use. <laughs> that yeah. would cry bullshit, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? But the idea of motion—it's either going to be horizontal, diagonal, yeah. vertical, circular, linear. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's all it will ever be. Now weaponize those motions, and you've got a ton of stuff. Weaponization in itself is you don't even have to teach that. You already know how, that you can destroy something without being taught. If, if the goal is to destroy something, you're making his brain stop. <laughs> I'm thinking, right? I'm thinking. So if the goal is to destroy something, hey, I need to break that. Doesn't matter what it is, I need to break that. You growing up again, your influences, your thoughts, and your well-being. Your, when you watch TV, you see things being destroyed. Oh, I can do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know how to do that mm -hmm. without having to be taught. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Yeah. So, so I, at that point, do I need to teach you that in the beginning? As opposed to all these techniques for breaking, all these different little motions. So, so that that's... 
that's where my mind was going with that is that you know um when you're talking about i need to break that intuitively yeah. okay i need to break